Amen. Let the church say amen. amen. Let the church say amen again. Let's stand and give God a great big hand praise. This is the day that the Lord hath made. We're going to rejoice and be glad. Amen. My mic is not working today. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, Pastor Mike's not working, but tell him my voice is. And so you can sing and shout for yourself today. Amen. Amen. The Bible says there was a choir member one time, and he was so bad that he had all the instruments all around him, inside of him. When he walked, you could feel the drums starting to beat. When he walked, you could hear the trumpet blowing. When he walked, you could hear uh, the synthesizer going on and all of that kind of stuff. And he was uh, one of the archangels of God, and he was called Lucifer. Say Lucifer. And his job was to praise the Lord. And the moment mankind came on and his job was to worship and to praise the Lord, that Lucifer got jealous and decided he was going to bring down mankind because he wanted to stop the praise. Amen. Just like on Palm Sunday, they tried to stop the praise. But I need to tell you, when I think about the goodness of God and all he's done for me, it makes me want to shout sometime. Have I got a witness of when I think about how God woke me up this morning and I could have been dead and gone, then I start to shouting for the Lord today. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, God is good. And he's good on a Palm Sunday morning. Now turn back to your neighbor and say, neighbor, you've got a job today. You got to take the part of the crowd and start praising the Lord like never before. There's something to this thing called gratitude. When you're grateful for what God does for you, it does something to your brains and start to going down to the toes, the, the, the tip of the toes of your feet. When you know that God has been good, all of a sudden things shift in your life. Have I got a witness in the house? You want to know who's the most miserable people in the world? The people who don't know that God is a good God and they ought to be thankful to God. And so they walk around and look about, look at how bad things are instead of thinking about the fact that God is still in our midst. Let's bow our heads in the word of thanks unto God. The Bible says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with thanksgiving. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he who hath made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture coming to his presence with thanksgiving knowing that God is God Lord we thank you for this time that you've allowed us to assemble in this place and to worship you in spirit and truth we thank you for the last seven days that you woke us up in the morning and then laid us down to go to sleep at night we thank you for keeping all hurt harm and danger away from us we even thank you that the grim reaper, death itself, did not touch any of our family and our friends on last week. And so, God, we come in here with our own manual of gratefulness, our own individual reasons why we're thankful to you. And so we're going to collectively praise you for the many things that you've done for us, for our family. And even preserving this nation, even in spite of the roaringness of the devil who goes to and fro, seeking whoever he may devour. We thank you, God, that he may touch things, but he cannot ultimately destroy everything that you build up. Now, God, be with this choir, be with the people and their family. God, those who are on their way, we pray that you will keep them safe and wake up some other folk and remind them that this is the day that the Lord hath made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. In Jesus' name we pray and all the people of God said amen. Give God a great big hearty shout and amen. Come on, let's praise the Lord. Come on, Mount Zion. Turn to your neighbor and say Hosanna. Let's give the highest praise right now. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hallelujah. Hosanna, Hosanna. We come to give you all the glory and the honor. Hosanna, 
Church, say amen. Amen. Give our choir a great big hand praise today. Amen. Amen. As you stand on your feet and just think about the goodness of God and what God is doing for you, how God is blessing you, taking care of you, providing for you. Would you whisper a word of prayer, not for yourself, but for the person right next to you? In fact, if you can, touch a person next to you and just put your hand on their shoulder and whisper a word of prayer for them. It's as if you're consecrating and anointing them. Amen. God is good and he's good all the time. And the Bible says we're called to bear one another's infirmities and situation problems and illnesses and all of those kinds of things. So if you pray for the person right now and believe, would you also pray for our nation? Our nation is in peril. Our nation is in trouble. Our nation is in need of a revival. Our nation needs in the is in need of remembrance to remember that this is a nation that has been created by God himself very softly and that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above everything that we ask or think pray for me right now now as you lift you take your hands off the person's shoulder next to you would you pray for me and praying for me you're saying you're praying for the first family pastor Larry Pastor Dan and his family and their children. I felt somebody's prayer right then. I felt somebody's prayer right then. Now, again, pray for the nation. We're struggling between dictatorship and democracy. And only in November we're going to know whether or not democracy will rule this nation as it has for more than 200 years. Barack Obama and other presidents have called democracy the great experiment, which means we're trying to figure out whether or not democracy will be maintained in the United States and across the world, or whether or not we're going to have a one rule leader who will dictate to us what they want to dictate to us. It's not about party because the truth of the matter is, to some degree, every member or some members of different parties want to rule and take over without the voice of the people. And they do not believe in we the people, they believe in themselves. And the problem with our Congress and our Senate is so many of them are just doing what is comfortable for themselves and not for what is comfortable and what is necessary for the people. But the Bible says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then there will be a healing and a hearing from heaven. And so it's left up to us, the Christian people who know God and what God can do to shift and to change the mind of America and the world. I read wrote an article that you ought to read this week in the calling post where I said we must be careful about thinking that we're so against Putin and his dictatorship that we don't think that it could happen to many of our own people who will say yes a dictatorship is better than democracy you need to read it oh God we're praying right now for those who have asked for prayer we're praying against sickness right now we're praying against certain kinds of struggles that are not caused by ourselves but allowed by Satan himself. We're believing right now that you can get inside of our bodies and you can infiltrate our minds, not with negative things, but with good things. You told us to think on these things, that which is lovely, that which is holy, that which is noble, that which is good, that which is kind. You told us to think on those kinds of things. And I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would take all of those bad things out of our minds. That we might focus not on the bad, but on the good, God. We're praying that you would take out of our hearts and our spirits and our emotions not to be so critical about everything but to see even in the midst of it that the Lord is in his holy temple let all the earth keep silent before him we want to focus on you as Isaiah said I saw the Lord high and lifted up his train did fill the temple and I discovered that his whole presence 
invaded the temple right now God I pray that your angels will show up in this place God that your presence will be felt on our hearts and not only will your presence be felt on our hearts that we can even taste the goodness of God God we thank you God we thank you God we thank you Lord we thank you God we thank you because you loved us so much that you walked into Jerusalem and you said to us, oh, if we would just turn to you, things would shift in our lives. God, I'm praying against crime. I'm praying against an injustice justice system. I'm praying against police brutality. I'm praying against uh, drive-by shootings. I'm praying against drugs in our neighborhood. I'm praying against opioid in our community. I'm praying against politicians who do not look out for our affairs but only look out for their own self-interest. Self I'm praying against Christians who would not be the light of the world. I'm praying against those things. But I'm praying that we will see the light of you. In Jesus' name I pray. And all the people God said, amen. Give God a great big hand praise. Wave at your neighbor and say, hey neighbor, I'm glad to see you. Give this choir a great big hand praise today. Amen. As our announcements come at this time. Tuesday noon live and online Bible study is back. Join Pastor Larry starting March 5th for a new Bible study series on The Best is Yet to Come. This special session is going to teach about how to find a place of safety, stability, and trust in a world gone crazy. Don't miss this series. It's going to be life-changing. The month of March is Holy Month at Mount Zion. We want everyone to participate in four things. First, join our fasting and prayer challenge. Choose something to give up so you can draw closer to God. Then join us on Palm Sunday, March 24th. We are having Good Friday on March 29th at 12 p.m. with noon prayer at a Seven Last Words gathering of worship. For one hour, join us in the sanctuary for an interactive experience commemorating the seven last words of Jesus on the cross. And then our Resurrection Easter services on March 31st. We have a special day planned for our children's church. Invite your families so they can watch the kids on screen with Easter speeches. Then, after services, families can go across the street to Oakwood Park for the annual community Easter egg drop from an amazing helicopter swooping down, dropping Easter eggs with candy and even some with money. So it's going to be a day to remember. Will you commit to generosity this Easter? Each year we are working to maintain our building with upgrades, do maintenance to our prayer park, and parking lot support our outreach ministries like human trafficking victims assistance city mission and loving as we support families struggling financially all of this along with our food pantry is a part of our hope in the village ministry last year we started our gym project for youth and children who have been using our dream center this past winter for youth basketball and mentoring so on easter sunday we are asking all that are willing to bring hope by giving at least $50, $100, $250, or $500 above and beyond your regular giving. If you will participate in giving hope when you give this special offering, write hope on your envelope. Thank you for being faithful to the cause. Our Connect Group ministry is ready for you. This ministry is for those that like to connect socially with like-minded people. If you are interested in the following Connect opportunities, head to the Connect desk after services. In April there is a bowling outing being planned, this month there is a foodie group for those who love great restaurants, a travel group where you can explore together, and we even have a group for those who want to take dance lessons. Lastly, the summer is coming and if you golf or want to head out on the green sign up. The groups only happen if you register and participate. So if you're interested, sign up at the Connect desk or call the church. Hey everyone, it's Pastor Larry Macon Jr. and I'm just so delighted 
to have the opportunity to speak to you today. You know, as a leader, entrepreneur, and spiritual influencer, I'm passionate about helping others to reach their financial goals. I believe that financial freedom is within reach for everyone, and I'm here to help you make it a reality, but it starts with you. At our upcoming Freedom Conference Sunday on April 14th, we want to share with you some tips and also some strategies for successful budgeting, saving for the future, credit repair, and creating an alternate source of income. I hope on this special day that you'll leave with a clear plan of action that you can use to make your dreams a reality. I wanna tell you on this special day, at both services, we'll have partners and vendors around to assist you, and then after our 11 a.m. service, we'll have a business brunch for you to network and receive further resources to help you on your journey in the areas of financial freedom, business, and also entrepreneurship. Also, after the brunch, we will have some workshops available with some experts so you get answers to what you're looking for right away. If you want to join in this movement and be with us, let us know that you're attending. And if you want to be in one of our 30 to 45 minute master classes on that day, we want you to be there. Let us know. Go to the Connect Desk in the foyer or go online and just sign up or at mzov.org. There are four goals that I want everyone in our church to work toward these next few years. Number one, I want you to remember, we want everybody in this place to own some form of tangible property, a home or some piece of property in our country. We believe that ownership is what we need. Also, we want everyone to have a budget. Know what type of money that you bring in and how much you take out and plan your expenses so that you can make better decisions with your spending, which can also help you prepare for the future. Thirdly, this leads me to that third thing that I want everybody to remember. I want everyone to open or begin or to fund a savings account for your future or also for maybe your retirement, we call it. I call it for your financial freedom days of life and also for your future generations. Number four, we want everyone to work on an alternative source of income. If you got a job, then start a business on the side or a side job, get you a side hustle, we call it, or something to supplement your income. At the Freedom Conference, our Freedom in Life Sunday, we aim to help people learn how to take control of their life and take control of their finances. Together, we can make financial freedom a reality. I'm praying for you, I'm believing for you, and we want to anoint you in this realm of finance and business. So join with us. Remember, this is an ongoing movement of God here at Mount Zion Oakwood Village, and we're celebrating 10 years. Can you believe it? It's been 10 years since our first Freedom Conference and our first Freedom in Life movement. So this is so great, and we're, we're happy again to have you there. So be there April 14th. Put on your calendar. I want to see you there. Take care, and God bless you. Mount Zion on the move for Christ. Amen. Let's give God some praise for what he's doing here at Mount Zion. I'm going to ask if you would stand on your feet and let's just stand at the attention of God together today. And we're going to prepare our minds and our hearts for the tithing time, for the giving time. As we give together, let us not forgive. Forget about the blessings of God. Are there any blessed folk in the house? Say amen. If God's been good to you, can you say hallelujah? So we're giving because God first gave to us. So turn your Bibles, and even if you're watching with us online, we're going to read this text together, which talks about what happens also when you give, when you follow God's word, when you follow God's ways. The Bible says this. It says, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. And you say... Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, wherein have we robbed thee in tithes and offerings? Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now and here with, saith the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And let's read 12 together. And all nations shall call you blessed, 
for ye shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. Let us bow our heads in a moment of reflection, in a moment of thoughtfulness, thinking unto God. Take this moment just for a second to thank God for all that you have. A lot of times we think about what we don't have, but we should start thanking God for what we do have. Food on our table, clothing on our back. If you've got shelter over your head, somebody ought to say, God is good. The tithe acknowledges that God is a sovereign God. Thank him for his sovereignty. We call him in the Bible, we call him the great I am. God is person, eternal, self-sufficient, and self-contained. God has made us stewards over the earth. The Bible speaks about it. And, and we're stewards over what we are given, over, uh, excuse me, under his lordship. But think about this. I want you to know a steward gets to exercise the privilege of ownership, but a steward is not the owner. The truth of the matter is all we have and all we'll ever be is because God gave it to us. You know, it's ironic that some of the main reasons why people don't give is because it's a fear of not having enough. However, if we tithe, if we give our offering and we connect with God's covenant, we will always have enough. There's got to be a witness in this place where God has seen you through because you trusted, you trusted in God. The Bible calls him El Shaddai. Say El Shaddai. What does that mean? That means he's the one who nourishes. He's the one that gives. He's the supplier. And so he is the one that will supply you. He's the one that will bless you. He's the one that will give you everything you need. But all he's asked you to do is give with an open hand so that he can then put more than if you had kept it all to yourself. Is there a tither in the house? Say hallelujah. So as you give of your tithe and offering, don't give grudgingly, but give cheerfully because God loves a cheerful giver. I want you to bow your heads right now and let's just talk to God. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for being all sufficient. We thank you for meeting all the needs that we have, even the needs that are unseen. God, you've blocked some things from hurting our life. God, you've protected us in a certain kind of a way. And so I ask right now for a special hedge of protection around those who give a tithe and offering upon those that follow your ways and, and follow your word. Father, we thank you, God, for this beautiful church, all we're able to do, all the people that are able to adorn these doors and feel your presence because of the faithful people of God. I pray that the best is yet to come, not only in the life of our church, but in the life of those that are connected with us through this covenant of giving. We bless your name. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen and amen. I'm going to ask all of those that are bringing a tithe and offering, you can come right now to the tithe and offering baskets or give online through the Givelify app or mzov.org or the text to give. The song says, oh, how wonderful it is.
Amen. As you remain standing for just a moment, whispering a word of prayer for the man of God to preach the word of God, even now God is able to do exceedingly. He's able to do exceedingly above all that we ask or think. The Bible says that faith cometh. Say faith cometh. Say faith cometh by hearing. And then it says, by hearing the word of God. So faith comes just by you being here, hearing. You want to know, how can I increase my faith? How can I increase my relationship and trust in God? How can I increase my Christianhood, if you will? The Bible says, automatically, faith comes by hearing. Yes, it's not only by hearing in church, but it's by hearing words and sermons in your automobile. I call it the automobile university, and so I go to the university every time I travel from my house to the church and from church to the house. And when I'm going around the city, I get on the automobile university. And I put in one of the good tapes, and I know that there's not a better tape to put on than my own tape. So I listen to myself. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, that ain't true. I listen to Pastor Larry. I'm in the university, the automobile university, because I know that faith cometh by hearing, by hearing. And so I wake up in the morning and I not only talk to God, which is my prayer moments, but I begin to read books what people say about God, and that is my faith increasing by hearing. And so I work out on the treadmill, and instead of me getting all caught up into somebody else's dream, looking at pictures and movies of somebody else's dream to become movie stars, I watch and listen to audio tapes. Because faith cometh by how? Hearing. And so not only must you pray for me, but you must pray that God will open up your ears. The Bible says, he that hath an ear, which means he that hath or she that hath an opening ear. Let them, what? Hear. Because God knows that faith cometh by hearing and so not only must you pray for hearing me you must pray for your ear when you walk out of the doors of the church and you say well reverend didn't say a thing he was terrible today it was the worst sermon i have ever heard it's because you didn't open up your ears to hear what thus saith the lord and you came to church unfocused. Say unfocused. There is what is called the reticular act activation system. Say RAS. That's where uh, inside of your brain you can focus on one thing and kick everything else out. The reason why you don't get to experience worship because you didn't kick some stuff out thought about your your dinner what you're going to eat you thought about the Browns and the Cavaliers you thought about taking those high heels off taking those church clothes off and uh, you thought about looking around the church to see who showed up instead of you focusing on hearing the word of God. You didn't hear the choir, you saw the choir. But sometimes you can see with your ears. Y'all didn't get that. You listen with your ears. Did you pray for me? All right, go to your seat then. And those of you who didn't pray, you didn't focus. You, you can get something today. I'm grateful to God for church. Say, I'm grateful to go to church. Can you give God a great big hand praise for going to church? I don't care what you say. 
Going to church on Sunday makes a difference on Monday. Going to church on Sunday makes a difference all week long. I heard my deacon the other day. We went to a funeral service around the corner for one of our beautiful members, Wanda Jackson, who passed on to glory. Wanda had cancer in the first stage, and four months later she was deceased. But she came to the church about a month ago in the uh, hallway, saw me, we talked, we prayed. She looked like a pitch of health, and she said, Reverend, I have not been able to come to church. I haven't given my offering, and here is my offering. I wanted to come to give my offering. It, I did not know it would be her last offering to the church. But Deacon Watkins said that there's something about going to church on Sunday that makes a big difference. In fact, there is a research out there that those people who go to church and participate in worship and church are more likely to live 13.7 months longer than the person who don't go to church. Did y'all hear me? There's a research, put it up there. There's a research that says that, believe it or not. A research that says that you're more likely to live 13.7 years here it is those who participate in church or faith communities are likely to live an average of 13.7 years longer and experience affiliated psychological and physiological health benefits according to mark and davis 2005 what they're saying is is that you're more healthy just coming to church and you'll be more healthy in fact you'll start to laughing when you have gratitude say gratitude so the truth of the matter is, some of us should have been dead and gone 13.7 years ago. But we have lived longer just by participating in church. Because when you go to church on Sunday, the preacher will say, King Jesus will roll all burdens away. The preacher will say that the Lord will make a way out of no way. The preacher will say that there is a man in the city performing miracles in the church. The preacher will say, just cry out and yell out J-E-S-U-S, -S, which is who? Oh, I wish I had somebody in the house who knew how to say who? Why do we say Jesus? Because there's more medicine in the hem of his garments than all the hospitals in the world. Why do we say Jesus? Because with his stripes, we are healed. And when you come to church, you hang out with people who are nice, at least sometimes. <laughs> Turn to your neighbor, look at him and say, are you nice today to me? I saw a husband, a wife looked at her husband and turned her eyes. That's a shame on you. You say, I'm not going to look at you. You've been mean to me all week long, and then you want me to turn and say, you're so nice. You've been mean. Straighten yourself up, and then I'll start complimenting you. Did I get my point across? Just turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, you got 13.7 more years to live. Even if you're 80, you'll live to be 93.7 months longer if you come to church. So you need to tell your children, come to church. You need to tell your neighbor, get yourself to the Mount Zion church. Amen. Something wrong with a dog that don't waggle its own tail. Did y'all hear me? Or either go to Painesville if you're up in there with Bishop Marable. Amen. You need to tell your kids, you need to tell your grandkids, and anybody's out here complaining a whole lot, you need to tell them that God wipes away complaints. And he puts gratitude on your heart. Have I got a witness? Give God some praise if you believe that. And also go to Bible study. Turn to your neighbor and say, Pastor's going to start a Bible study. Going back to Bible study, put that up, in April. April. Now, I'm going to try for three weeks. If you don't show up, we're going to send you to the noon Bible study. And you're going to have to get off work and come over here at 12 noon and eat lunch with us at noon with Pastor Larry. 
but I'm starting a Bible study, going back to Bible study. It's going to be called the Family Bible Study on Wonderful Wednesday. Say Wonderful Wednesday at 6.30. Now, I'm going to sow a seed into the community or into you because I want God to do something for me. I always said that if you have a vision for something, always sow a seed. Say sow a seed. When you sow a seed into your vision, the Bible says you will reap always more than you sow. Amen? And so you got to sow a seed into the ground. Now, it doesn't say throw a seed. It says sow a seed. A farmer doesn't just throw the seed out anywhere. Rather, he is meticulous in where he throws it and how, not throw it, how he places it in the ground very carefully. And he expects and harvest to, to emerge, right? But the harvest does not emerge immediately. The Bible says there's two seasons, sowing and harvesting. Doesn't it say that? And so when you sow, it says you're going to harvest. The problem is, or the difference is, that you don't harvest everything at the same time because you don't sow at the same time. So don't get upset with me because I'm already harvesting. Your harvest may come a little later. And my, my harvest is just an encouragement to your, your harvest and your sowing of seed. So I'm going to sow my seed, and I'm going to make sure every family that comes and, sh and shares with me on that first Wednesday, which is after Easter Sunday, I want, I want to make sure you're fed. I want you to get some. Bring your family. I especially want single-parent family. Say single-parent family. I want to be uh, a fatherly to them on that night in those three weeks uh, after that. Sister Megan going to be doing SES after that. But anyway, uh, and then I want uh, elderly people and I want lonely people. Are there any lonely people tonight? Some wives said I'm lonely with him. Husband said I'm lonely with her. <laughs> but I want you to come on that first week. Uh, in April. Let me move on to the text. Did y'all put that up there? Yeah. Let me go on to the text here very quickly because everybody wants to hear about the Palm Sunday morning, uh, Palm Sunday experience. Amen. That's found in the book of Luke. Say Luke. Luke, the 19th chapter, and I'll read it. He's going to put up the main text up there, Luke 19, 30 through 31. And I'm going to talk about enlist me a donkey. Enlist me a donkey. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, go find Jesus a donkey. Say, neighbor, go get a donkey for Jesus. Say, enlist a donkey. But say, neighbor, God needs something more than a donkey to do his work. Say, neighbor, he needs you far above the donkey. To do his work. All right, I'm not preach, so I guess I'll sit down. Here's what it says here, and I'm, I'll just read it for the sake of the context, and you can focus in on verse 30 and 31. It says, After Jesus, in 28, after Jesus has said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem, as he approached Bethphage and Bethany, as he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you. And as you enter it, you will find a coat, a donkey tied there, a young donkey, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it, say untie it, and bring it here. Say untie it, and bring it here. Say untie it. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, you need to be untied and brought to the Lord. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it, tell him or her, the Lord needs it. Say, the Lord needs you. In verse 37, it says, When he came near the place where, he, where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Say, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Turn to your neighbor and say he's going to talk about just for a moment. Enli enlist. 
Jesus a donkey. When I think in terms of enlistment, I think in terms of a 20th century artist who was one of the famous artists during the early 1900s. He actually did not really paint as he did draw. And so he would make marvelous, marvelous drawings. In fact, this particular artist who could really draw things started drawing at the age of one. If you care to know his name, his name is James Montgomery Flagg. And Flagg was commissioned by the United States to, to draw a certain picture that would attract men and women from across the country, especially during the Germany occupation, World War I, I believe. And, and he was commissioned to create a painting that would cause men and women all around the country to enlist in the armed services against Germany and Adolf Hitler. His name was James Montgomery Flagg. And he drew a sort of simple picture. It was a picture, it was a picture of an old man with a white beard and what I call an Abraham Lincoln hat, white, blue, and red. And the picture was a picture which was later called the picture of the most richest uncle we have in the world and yet the most indebted uncle we have. His name was Uncle Sam. And up under that picture of Uncle Sam, those of you who are old enough to remember it, there were these words, I want you which suggested that Uncle Sam wanted all the men and women he could get to defend this nation. I became enthralled, I became intrigued with this idea of enlistment, especially when I saw in the text given by Luke the idea that Jesus wants to enlist a donkey. He wants to enlist a donkey. Now, when you hear that, you, you think in essence that God is so interested in shifting things by way of a donkey. But the truth of the matter is, this is metaphoric. It is, it is a parallel. It is a kind of parable. It is what we call a similitude or something that is similar to something else which means that Jesus is really not really wanting the donkey, but he really wants somebody that the donkey represents, which is mankind or humanity. He, he's not really interested in the donkey. He's really interested in you and me. And he really wants to enlist us, not in the armed services, but as members inside of the kingdom of God. I wish I had time to preach this thing. You see, we're not really citizens of the United States of America, though we are. We're not really citizens of greater Cleveland uh, community, though we are. We're not citizens in the state of Ohio, though we are. We are citizens in the kingdom of God. Uh, the first sermon to which Jesus preached is a sermon about the kingdom of God has come upon you. And the reason why he is preaching the kingdom of God because a kingdom has a king. And he wants to become the king of kings. He really wants to make each of us kings inside. I wish I had time. Yeah, this must be too early for you this morning. He really wants each of us to become kings and, if you will, queens in the kingdom of God. And, and he's not really, can I help you out? Not really interested in the donkey as he is interested in you and me. And the, and the way I reach that particular conclusion is that in order to read a text, you have to read the context. 
You have to read what is surrounding the text, what is before the text and after the text and intertwined inside of the text in order to understand what a scripture really, really does mean. And in the first part of the chapter, Jesus is talking about a brother by the name of Zacchaeus. And he actually is basically saying, uh, Zacchaeus, I need you. He is going into Jericho, I believe it is, and in going into Jericho, the crowd has come along and people are, uh, are, 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 are around him. The crowd is there, but he points and begins to focus in on somebody in the crowd, and the person who he's focusing in on is a brother by the name of Zacchaeus, and the Bible says that Zacchaeus, watch this, is up a tree. You know, uh, that's where a whole lot of us really are. We are really up a tree. We're, we're really not down on solid ground, but we are up a tree. We're up a tree with our families. We're up a tree with our communities. We're up a tree with our nation. We are up a tree in our relationships with each other. We're up a tree inside of the church. We're up a tree. I, I, I declare to you, we're up a tree. I wish I had some up a tree folk who were honest today and say I came today, but I want you to know, Pastor, last week I've been up a tree. I've been up a tree with my desires. I've been up a tree with my dreams. I've been up a tree with my language. I've been up a tree with my relationships. I've been up a tree. Oh, my job. And Jesus is passing through and saying to you, the modern days the chaos come down from the tree that I might abide I wish I had some power in this mic that I might abide in your house when God comes to your house things ought to be different have I got a witness in the house up a tree and he says he says very quickly Zacchaeus I, I, I want you to come down to me. And if you come down, the Bible seems to suggest this concept of downness means humbleness. Humility is coming down. The reason why some folk won't never go into church because they come in here with their critical attitudes as if they know everything and, and they don't run, really don't care about anything. They only come out of ritualistic uh, position. But the truth of the matter is uh, they're going to walk out as high-minded as they came in. The Bible says he or she who humbles themselves shall be exalted. But the exalted person ain't going to get nothing out of this thing unless they begin to humble themselves. I I know you know everything but for a moment just toss it out and let me put something else inside of your mind and your brains and your spirit turn to your neighbor and said it might help you and, and so and so and so when he says the cast I need to come by and abide in your house it is parallel to the donkey I need a donkey but the donkey represents the Zacchaeus inside of the world who need to come down off their high horse or their sycamore tree. And a sycamore tree is broad, has branches that can hold you, and it seems as if you can stand the sycamore tree all along, all the time. But I need to tell you, there will come a time in your life when the wind shall blow and you shall fall out of your sycamore trees. Come down! I need you. But in the text it says, I need it, a donkey. You need to know that Luke is a marvelous, marvelous writer. He is one of the synoptic writers in the Bible. He is one of the synoptic gospel writer, good news writers in the Bible. There are four, there are three synoptic writers in the Bible. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Matthew, Mark, Luke, three synoptic writer and one anti-synoptic writer, that's John. And so these three synoptic writer writes the same story but gives certain kinds of details that the other one may not give, gives certain kinds of slants to the particular story that the other writer may not give them. And so Luke is going to give you a slant here or give us a slant to the Palm Sunday morning story. John talks about the palm tree and leaves that were placed there it is Luke who focuses in on the donkey, say the donkey. 
he says that he te Jesus tells his disciples to go in a place called Bethphage and Bethany. Now, all of us know where Bethany is. It is it's, it's five miles south of Jerusalem, but nobody knows where Bethphage is. And what God is going to say, I need to use this donkey in this place somewhere between Bethphage where nobody knows where this place is and Bethany, they know it at that time. And he's suggesting, I think, to us that there are some of us who are in Bethany and other us of us are in places that we don't even know we're in. Y'all gonna work me up in here, up in here. And say, go get a donkey. Say, go get a donkey. I'm almost finished. Say, go get a donkey. And I need you to untie the donkey. Now, I already told you this is a kind of parallel with Zacchaeus, who is also tied up. He's tied up in his money. He's tied up in his materialism. He's, he's tied up in his position as a tax collector. He is tied up in his oppressive ideology of oppressing the Jews and skimming the Jews out of their money when he collects taxes. He's not only collecting taxes for uh, the Roman Empire, but he's also taking some of the tax money for himself. He's a crook. Say he's a crook. And he's tied to that kind of lifestyle. The truth of the matter is there are too many of us who are tied to unhealthy lifestyles. I'm not talking about on Sunday morning. Y'all look good on Sunday morning. But there's other times of the week y'all ain't so cool looking. Don't look at me. The Bible says the truth shall set you free. We are tied to some things that aren't unhealthy. So he says, loose him, loose the donkey, loose the young donkey, loose the coat, loose the donkey, and let him go. Which means, watch this, too many of us are tied up and most of us need to be released of something. Just turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, what do you need to be released of? Say, neighbor, you, you can tell me. Say, I won't tell nobody. Say, you can, you can tell me what it is that got you all tied up and messed up. Say, neighbor, you, 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 you covered it up this morning. You put on a suit, a tie, and a white shirt. Shined your shoes, your dress is looking good, but... But underneath all of that, where are you tied up? Uh, 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 some of us are tied up, and I'll be very quickly since I said I would be. Some of us are tied up to a word that my mother said don't never use. And the word is ain't. Mama said there ain't no such word as ain't, but they put it in the dictionary later on. She said, don't ever say ain't and don't ever say can't. And some of us are tied up to the word ain't and can't and always have an, an excuse for what we can't do. I can't do nothing now because I'm old and I'm a senior person. I can't write that book that's been in me for the last 30 years. I can't go back to college when I need to go back to college. I can't buy a home because I can't afford a home. I can't get that car that I really want. I can't do this and I can't do that and because I can't do this and that then I ain't going to do it. I can't have a good life. I can't live like that. I can't have that kind of experience. I can't go to church on Sunday. Sunday morning. I can't come to Bible study on Wednesday. I can't attend on Tuesday afternoon Bible study. I can't be
be a good husband. I can't be a good wife. I can't be the kind of son or daughter that my mama want me to be. I can't read my Bible. I can't wake up 30 minutes in advance and try to read what thus said the Lord. And because I can't, I wish somebody would just turn that up a little louder. I can't because I ain't excuses. I can't do this. I can't do that. Yes, you can. As Obama or on once run. Yes, you can. Take it up just a little bit louder. Yes, you can. He says, release. Say, release. Now, once you release, he says, you got to re-enlist once you release it even you know you accepted Jesus Christ a long time ago I came to Jesus just as I was I was weary wounded and worn but I found in him a resting place and he has made me glad but since then I've been all tied up Jesus says I want you to release that's why I came to the world that's why I walked 33 and a half years that's why I went to Calvary and died and with my stripes you are healed because I wanted you to be released and become a member in the kingdom of God not necessarily a member of the church I want you released but once I release you now once I make you free and who is free is free indeed once I make you free then I need you to re-enlist inside of my kingdom and the kingdom has been expressed through the church and, and I need you to have an identification badge as a member of the kingdom of God through the church I need you to get baptized because it symbolized that you have been re-enlisted into the army of God and I need you to begin living the life that I have designed for you I need you to understand that when the praises go up the blessings will come down I need you to understand that the more gratitude you have the more stability you will find yourself in times of trouble I need you to re-enlist into the kingdom of God I need you to make a commitment because when you re-enlist I extend your service time 13.7 seven years and you find yourself living a different kind of a life you find yourself walking a different kind of life you find yourself thinking that I can do all things now through Christ who strengthened me and no matter what happens I can abase or I can abound but I can do all things through Christ Jesus I, I, you begin to understand no weapon formed against me whether it is the government whether it is the state whether it is the city whether it is my community whether it is myself no weapon formed against me shall ever prosper because I've been re-enlisted into the kingdom of God and once you are re-enlisted into the kingdom of God it's time for you to get on Jesus and you must allow Jesus to ride you to your destiny have I got a witness in the house the Bible says untie the, the donkey bring him to me because I've got another destiny I've got to take him to another place I got to take him down to Jerusalem I've got to get on top of him and I've got to tame him he's an untamed animal he has never been ridden by any other man but I must make him understand that when I'm coming into Jerusalem I'm coming in like the Old Testament king kings rode in on duckies when they were victorious not a horse it symbolized they won the war they won the battle and I need to tell you when you when you get on the back of Jesus you're going to win the battles you're going to win the war you're going to be all right you're going to be stable he is going to take you into your destiny He's going to give you the career you want. He's going to make you write those books you never thought you could write. He's going to make you have a relationship with people you thought you could not have a relationship. He's going to make you think a different. He's going to say, this mind that is in you is now the mind of Jesus. The old folks said, let Jesus lead you. How far do I want him to lead me? I want him to lead me all the way. I want him to lead me in the morning. I want him to lead me in the afternoon. I want him to lead me at nighttime. I want him to lead me through sunny days I want him to lead me in dark moments I want him to lead me I want him to lead me when I got my mind right I want him to lead me when my mind ain't correct I want him to lead me when my body is right I want him to lead me when my doctor says uh-uh there's something going on here Larry I want to say I want Jesus to lead me because I want to ride 
I wish I had a witness in the house. I want to ride. I want to ride. Somebody said, right on. Right on. Right on. King Jesus, no man can hinder me. Come on, quiet. Come on, stand on your feet. These monitors went down or something. Right on. He doesn't want a donkey. The donkey is symbolic of the man, Zacchaeus. The donkey is symbolic of the fact that the way you know a king is victorious, he comes in by way of a donkey. But he's interested in you and me. Give God some praise. As you bow your heads, as you bow your heads, again, touching the person next to you, would you tell God that you believe the person next to you that you're now touching wants to be written by him? There's other things and other people who are riding you. Some people, drugs are riding them. For other people, violence is riding them. For other people, disappointment is riding them. For a few of us, difficulties are riding us. But we want to sat upon, we want Jesus to ride on us. I keep telling you that you're not a citizen of earth. You are a citizen of heaven. And Paul said you have dual citizenship. And if the king, if, if, if God is your king, just like in England, you have King Charles. And whenever you have a king, the subjects must act like the king. I've always asked myself, why is it that British people sound British and they come from Africa going to England? It is because they must sound like the king. I've always asked, why do British Africans wear suits in the summertime? It's because they must wear suits like the king and they must dress like the king at all times. It is the same with you. You are king's kids, and you must act like the king kid. If you're here today and you don't have a church, or you're not a part of the kingdom, or you want to reaffirm being in the kingdom of God, or if you're just here and you just want to unite and connect with us, I want you to step out in one of the aisles and just come up front. Maybe you've been coming to church, but we want to know who you are. We, we're not interested in membership. We're interested in connecting. We have a connect ministry where we will connect with you. You need us, we'll be there. We need you, you'll show up with us. We want to connect with you because we want you to read inspiring words that we give. Marvelous interviews that Pastor Larry gives with people. Helping people. If you're here today, as every head is bowed, if you're here today and you don't have a church home, would you lift your, up your hand? Just lift it up real high. If you're here today, just lift up your hand and be honest. You will never be released until you are totally honest. If you're not honest, you're going to find out that you're going to be tied up still. We won't criticize you. It's okay that you haven't been in church or you haven't been going to your church. Maybe God has led you to Mount Zion Church. Lift your hand up and just be honest. Man, woman, boy, girl. I see a hand that is lifted up in the audience. Praise God for you. If you're here today and you've not been baptized, would you just lift up your hand? You have not been baptized of water. You know you have not been baptized. Just, yes, I see a hand. Is there another? Every head is bowed. If you're here today and you would like to just connect with us, just lift up your hand. Just hit, lift, lift up your hand if you want to connect with us. Amen. You're being honest. Thank you for being honest with me. I saw your hand in the back area. We want you to connect with us. 
And today what we want you to do is, if you are not connected to us, that means you're not receiving our emails, you're not receiving our Facebook posts and other things, I want you to take the card that is in front of you or in one of the pews. I want you to fill that card out. Say, everybody say, fill the card out. And I want you to give it to the lady that's at the desk in the front lobby of the church. If you're here today, you want to be baptized. I want you to fill the card out. If you want us to just pray for you, I want you to fill the card out today. Would you do that for me? If you do that for me, you're doing it for Jesus. Because I guarantee you that your life is going to shift. The moment you walk out that door, you're going to feel the presence of God on your heart. And all of a sudden, you're going to say, I don't know what happened today, but something went on in that church that made me a little different. And I'm believing that because I'm speaking it. The Bible says that there is life and death and the power of the tongue. And so I'm speaking life for you. Eternal God, our Father, we thank you for this marvelous worship experience. For these who are marvelous worshipers in the kingdom of God, we ask, O oh God, that they will go out as a marching army, believing that the general is in front of them and wherever they're led, that they would do just like the donkey for the first time in his life who had not been ridden. He follows where Jesus takes him, even down into a parading crowd to a moment of sadness where he says, oh Jerusalem, oh Jerusalem, how often would I have wrapped my arms around you, but you wouldn't let me. And so God, we thank you for reminding us that you're trying to enlist us into your service to change your kingdom. As you prayed and told us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Give God a great big hand praise, y'all. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, that didn't hurt. Consider yourself dismissed. Amen. Y'all preached too long today.